Good to see you guys today. I hope that you're having a good morning. Uh, it is the Lord's Day, and so it's good to be in this house with you all. If you're visiting today, my name is Kyle. I serve as the lead pastor here, and I want to say thank you for being with us. Um, if you would, go ahead and grab your Bible, open it to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, um, it's in your Old Testament, just after the book of Psalms and Proverbs. Um, and then we're going to be in chapter 5 this morning, so I'll give you a second uh, to find that. Uh, as you're looking, I'll kind of catch you up on, on where we're at uh, in this series that we've called What Happens When We Worship, where we're just examining what happens when we come together week in and week out to worship God, uh, what happens in the service. And so when we say worship, um, you know, worship has a modern, if you will, connotation of singing only or music only. We talk about worship music a lot, uh, but when we talk about a when we talk about worshiping God specifically in a worship service, we're not referring to the singing portion only. And so each week, I just want to remind us of that that what we're talking about when we say what happens when we worship, we're talking about the service altogether, from beginning to, from the call to worship uh, to the final prayer before we go home today. What's taking place in all of those things? Does it matter? Why does it matter? And so on and so forth. So last week we talked about how week in and week out what we're doing in worship, if it's done right, is we're rehearsing God's covenant faithfulness toward us. And so we're rehearsing the way that God comes to us over and over again in His kindness, in His goodness. We've been unfaithful to His covenant. Israel was unfaithful to His covenant. The people of God have always been unfaithful to the covenant. And so God comes to us now in Christ. Christ is a mediator of a new covenant, Hebrews says. This is a covenant of grace. It's a covenant that's built on the faithfulness of God. It's where our unfaithfulness is covered by the righteousness of Christ. And so now we enter in to worship week in, week out with confidence. Now, confidently entering into worship is a relatively new concept. This wasn't something that Old Testament believers had much of. They didn't get to enter in with a lot of confidence because people died a lot entering into worship in the wrong ways. But here we enter in by grace. And so this week, I want to talk to you about how God sets the agenda for worship. Just because there's grace doesn't mean there's not law. <laughs> Just because there's grace doesn't mean there aren't rules we should follow when we worship God. It doesn't mean that it's void of His commands or of His prescriptions for what happens in worship. Those things are absolutely present. And so I want to lay before you, you can write this down if you're taking notes. Kids, you've got guides now. I want you to take notes with us. There'll be things back here that you can write down. Um, first thing I want you to write down is this. Worship that pleases God hangs on knowing and submitting to His agenda. Worship that pleases God hangs on knowing and submitting to His agenda. Now, Hopefully, you found Ecclesiastes chapter 5 by now. So, let's read verses 1 and 2. Would you stand to your feet together? Uh, when I'm finished reading, I'll say, this is the word of the Lord, and I would ask that you reply, thanks be to God. Amen? All right, Ecclesiastes 5, verse 1 and 2. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools for they do not know that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray for us before you sit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We approach it now in humility. We ask, Lord, for you to teach us. Lord, help us not to come with uh, preconceptions, with ideas of our own making or ideas that have been passed to us uh, from men that would be wrong. But Lord, help us to bring those things to you, to lay them on the altar and allow you to burn them up if necessary or to fortify them 
uh, where it's good and right to do so. Now, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we have it to train us. Uh, it, it equips us for every good work. It teaches us, Lord, that we might rightly know the God we worship. We might rightly know, in this case today, how to worship. And Lord, that we might rightly know how to live for you day in and day out. And so, Lord, would you open our hearts and minds to receive it today. Lord, help us to be that, um, that ground that is made up of good soil receptive to the seed of your word, receptive to the watering of that seed that it might grow in us and bear fruit. Lord, we are helpless uh, for this endeavor on our own, and we are dependent now upon your spirit. And so we ask that he enlighten us, that he uh, bring to bear your word on our lives that we might live it out. Uh, Lord, and all of this is meant for the glory of God and not our own glory. And so we ask these things in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 1 says, Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. So the preacher here in Ecclesiastes is laying out instruction. And he's telling you, do not be hasty in worship, but guard your steps. Do not draw near um, as those who offer, sacrifice, uh, offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil, but draw near as one who is ready to listen to God. And so I ask you, when you read something like that, it comes to the question comes, have, have I given thought, have you given thought to what we're doing week in and week out as we worship the Lord together? We already established that we come to meet with God. We've talked about that in, in weeks previous. We talked about it more last week. We're going to talk about it some more today. We have come to meet with God. Nothing less than that is true. Really, nothing more than that is true. And so we've established that we meet with God week in and week out. We've established that meeting with God would be terrifying. This is what we talked about last week as we talked about the renewal or the reminder of this covenant week in and week out. It would be a terrifying thing to meet with God apart from the mediator, Christ Jesus. And so if it weren't for His Son, if it weren't for a mediator, if it weren't for being able to come in and say, I'm covered by the blood of the Lamb, then coming in would be terrifying. And it should be, because apart from being covered by the Lamb of God, apart from being covered by your faith in Christ, by the blood of Christ, apart from that, you would be coming in nothing but your sin. You would be bringing your sin to the Lord. You would be bringing your presumptions to the Lord. You would be bringing your own confidence in yourself before the Lord. And so you would stand naked and ashamed before God. But as it stands now, if you come in Christ, you come clothed in a righteousness that is not your own, but is now your own. You stand clothed as one who is unworthy of such clothing, of such a robe, but nevertheless, you've been given the robe because, well, His mercy is more. Amen? And so when man encounters God in the Bible, we see it over and over again. When man encounters God in the Bible, several things happen, but some of which are he has to hide his eyes. He has to shield himself. He bows and he cannot look upon that which he beholds. In other instances, the men of God who encounter God, are they refer to themselves as being undone before the Lord. They're brought to the, what that means is they're brought to the ends of themselves. To be undone means to stand naked and ashamed before the Lord. It's to recognize that I have brought nothing to Him on my own, which makes me worthy to stand before such a holy God. We see other instances of fear. We see fear when uh, people encounter not necessarily God Himself, but angels from the Lord. There's great fear in them. Why? Because the holiness of God is terrifyingly powerful. <laughs> it 
Bless you. The holiness of God is, uh, it's all, what holiness means is that He's altogether set apart from us. And when we say He's altogether set apart from us, we mean that He is altogether perfect. That He's altogether righteous. That He's altogether able to judge sin. And He's the only one able. And so there's great benefit in having Christ as our mediator because it's by Christ that we are able to enter in with confidence. As I said a moment ago, it's by Christ that we draw near to God without any fear. But but it's easy to take for granted the benefit of coming before God who is omnipotent. That means that He's all-powerful. It's easy to take for granted that we get to come before an all-powerful God and walk away unscathed by it as we stand in Christ. But not only do we we walk away unscathed, we, we walk away blessed by it. We walk away with the ability to become more like what we've seen because of Christ. But because we can lose sight of it, because we can lose sight of what it means to come before an all-powerful God, it's easy to begin to treat God as though He's, you know, a, a stuffed animal that a child might sleep with. And we can cuddle up next to Him and we can do with Him whatever we want to do. Because He's tame and He's safe and there's nothing about Him that is threatening to us. But I'm reminded again, and I think I've mentioned this a few times, but it's worth mentioning again. When Christ wielded His power, as He stands in the boat and the storm is raging, He stands there with His disciples, He wields His power for peace. And He says, peace, be still. And the storms were calmed. What we read there is that His disciples were afraid. Once they were afraid of what was outside the boat, the storm, the raging waters, the water coming into the boat, the fear of drowning. But now, in the midst of peace, everything's calm, everything's perfect. But they recognize that the man in the boat is altogether different than they are, and it says that they feared him and asked themselves, what kind of man is this that even the wind and the waves obey his voice? You see, there's a fear there of the Lord. Why? Because He's powerful. He wielded His power for their good, but they're afraid. They're afraid. They understand that He controls all things. Anybody read C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia? Raise your hand. Kids, yeah? All right. If you haven't, kids, read it. You say, well, I can't read yet. Make your mom and dad read it to you. It's wonderful. All right, it's fantastic. In C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia, in uh, one of the early books, actually the Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe book, Lucy, the little girl there, learns that Aslan, she's just hearing about him for the first time, she learns that Aslan, the king of Narnia, is a lion. And fear. At first, she was excited to meet Aslan, but now fear creeps in, and she asks Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. She says, then he isn't safe? To which Mr. Beaver gets really excited. He goes, safe? Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. When the preacher of Ecclesiastes says, guard your steps when you go to the house of God, he isn't warning worshipers not to go to the house of God, is he? He's not saying don't go. He's warning worshipers not to waltz into worship indifferently, not to go in apathetically, not to go in as the fools do, he says who make all their utterances before the Lord and proclaim all their things before God and are not concerned with orderly worship. He says, don't go in that way. He says, guard your steps. 
In other words, remember when you go to meet with Almighty God, remember that as you go in, you are, first of all, meeting with Almighty God, and so therefore, worship in the way that He ordains. And so I tell you, brothers and sisters, meeting with God isn't safe, so to speak, but it is altogether good. It's good for your soul. It's good for your life. It's good for your marriages. It's good for your children. It's good for your home. It's good for the whole man, mind, soul, body, Everything about it is good for you. It's good. And so God commands us through the preacher here in Ecclesiastes 5, guard your steps. Now to rightly guard your steps, to put a fence around something, to guard something means there's parameters, right? There's things that must be uh, observed, things we must either do or listen to, or not do, or not listen to, right? So the fence keeps out, but it also keeps in. And so uh, to rightly guard our steps, we must obey God's commands for worship. This is how we guard our steps. We can't can't just guard, we, we can't guard steps if we don't know what guarding it even means, right? But God teaches us what it means to guard your steps. And if you'll guard your steps, then meeting with God over and over, week in and week out in worship, is eternally good for you. It's eternally good for you. And so worship that pleases God, again, hangs on knowing and submitting to His agenda. Then the question comes in, do I have to? Ecclesiastes 5.2, Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. You've likely heard it many times. Oh, do I have to, Dad? Do I have to, Mom? It's the cry of an unsubmissive heart. Let's not fool ourselves into thinking that such a heart only belongs to little children. Everyone is found guilty of an unsubmissive heart. We live in a society that is about self first. It's all about unsubmissiveness. It's all about paving your own way. It's all about making your own path. Preaching, speaking, believing your own truth. It's all about being unsubmissive. In other words, it's all about rebellion. A quick study of people's New Year's resolutions reveals this for us. They were, I mean, your social media was likely as flooded as mine was, of people saying, this year I'm putting myself first. My physical health, my mental health, my emotional health. And and my initial thought is, well, good luck looking more at yourself, hoping to make yourself better. It don't work that way. Like the comedian said, why would I do that? Myself is the one who got me in this mess to begin with, right? However, it doesn't stop us from approaching weekly worship with the same mentality. Rather than looking into God's Word, Jonathan Cruz says this in his book, rather than looking into God's Word to see how we ought to worship Him, we come up with our own methods based on personal preferences. We decide this is the thing I like. And so worship becomes like a matter of taste rather than a matter of God's commands. I like their worship team. I like the songs they sing better. I like that style of preaching better. I like this length of service over that length of service. That church has better carpet and lighting, right? I mean, you name it. People leave and join churches for all sorts of foolish reasons. Things that God has not laid out But is worship really just a matter of preference? Do we really get to just come in on a Sunday morning and say, this is what we like? Have we orchestrated a worship service on Sunday mornings just because we think this is what's best? Just because we came up with this idea and it's like, well, you know, this is pretty similar to what all the other churches are doing. Let's just do that. Or do you think there was more thought into it?
I don't think it's up to sinful worshipers to tell God how we worship. I don't think it's up to us to say this is what we're going to do today. I think He dictates the terms. I believe that if we're meeting with God each week, and we are, then it is best for us to submit to God's agenda for worship, not our own. He is God, after all. Amen? And so this is the preacher's argument here in Ecclesiastes. Because God is in heaven, he says, and you are on earth, we come to hear from him. He says, therefore, let your words be few. Think about it this way. If you show up at work tomorrow morning, and you walk in and your boss comes to you and he says, I need you to come into my office, I've got to meet with you. Chances are real high that you're not going to walk in, bust into his office like Kramer, you know, plop down in a chair, throw your feet up on his desk and say, what's good, boss man? Right? You're not doing that. You're going to walk in, somber probably, because if the boss says, I've got to meet with you, that may not be a good thing. You're going to close the door behind you because you're like, I ain't letting nobody hear this. You're going to find your seat, and you're going to wait on him to begin the conversation. Why? Because your superior has requested a meeting with you, and a right response is appropriate. And so you're going to respond appropriately. You recognize what that means. Well, the same should be true when God calls us to meet with him. He is far superior to us. We are dust and ashes to him. And when he calls us to meet with him, he sets the agenda. We wait on him. We cannot do whatever we please. We must do what he commands. And so again, Ecclesiastes 5.1, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. It's important. The idea of guarding your steps means to walk prudently, to look around at your surroundings as you go. It's to avoid the cracks and the crevices, the holes that others are falling into. You're guarding your steps. You're being careful in how you worship. God cares how we worship. And if we do not worship Him according to His agenda, then we are placing ourselves in danger. We're tempted to balk at this idea that we're in any kind of danger for worshiping God inappropriately. And I think it's because worship is personal, or at least you know, it is personal. And so we think that personal preference drives the worship, but it doesn't. We think, surely God doesn't care how we worship. He only cares that we worship. But there's arrogance in that. There's arrogance in saying, surely God doesn't care how I worship. He only cares that I worship. What does that do? It places you and your preference above God and His commands. Again, Jonathan Cruz is helpful here. He illustrates this line of thought well by saying this. He says, I'm so great and important that God should be thrilled at the prospect of getting any of my attention. What a privilege for Him that I would worship Him. Surely He's so attention-starved that He will take whatever I give Him. Cruz goes on to add, but that's not the case. God doesn't need us. He doesn't need our worship. But if we're going to worship, we better do it properly. And so worship that pleases God hangs on knowing and submitting to His agenda. There's a couple of stories in the Old Testament about brothers. In Genesis chapter 4, we have the story of Cain and Abel. Raise your hand, you've heard of Cain and Abel. All right, all right, boys and girls, good job. Cain and Abel, right? One got mad at the other one and took his life. Basically the story, correct? But why? What happened? Well, they bring their offering to the Lord. One's received, the other is rejected. And so the one who had his offering rejected gets mad and murders his brother. He's jealous. In Genesis 4, 3-5, through 5, it says, In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering. And I'm not here to debate these things, but I do want you to notice a couple of words. An offering of the fruit of the ground. That's what Cain brought. An offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought, what? Of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. So, Cable brings a piece of the pie. Ab uh, Cain, did I say Cable? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Anybody, anybody have a brain that moves faster than your mouth can move sometimes? All right. Not cable, Cain, but, you know. So Cain brings an offering. Abel brings the best. The best of what the Lord's given him, he says, I'm giving the Lord the first fruits of this. And so it says there in verse 4 that the Lord had regard for Abel and his offerings. That means he accepted Abel and his offerings, but for Cain and his offering, so both Cain and his offering, the Lord had no regard. He rejected Cain and Cain's offering. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. Now, later in the story, the Lord comes to Cain and he says, listen, sin is crouching at your door. It seeks to devour you. Turn now, essentially. He warns him. And Cain doubles down, murders his brother. The rest is, as we say, history. God has regard for one form of worship and not another. That's what this teaches us. The point here is there's a form of worship that is acceptable to God and a form of worship that is not acceptable. There's a form of offering that's acceptable and there's a form of offering that is not acceptable. So we must be careful how we worship. If we're going to worship in a way that displeases God, then we should beware that it might not only be our worship that gets rejected, but we may be soon rejected as well. If worship is merely up to us, then we're going to create something we like, something that makes sense to us. This is what they did in Exodus when they created a golden calf and said, this is our God that led us out of Egypt. And I mean, anybody looking at the golden calf says, well, that doesn't look a lot like all the things we saw, surely. But no, many were guilty of such foolish worship in that moment. And so we don't want to make any golden calves. We don't want to create worship that appeals to us. We want worship that is pleasing to the Lord. And so doing, if we do that, if we make worship that appeals to us, we will end up worshiping ourselves rather than God because we are sinful creatures. The best we can do is a bigger and better version of ourselves. That's it. It's the best we can do on our own. But God is altogether different from us. He is holy. He's not a bitter, bigger and better version of us. He is just simply bigger and better. Amen? He, he is God, and He determines what is acceptable in worship and what is not. I told you there were two stories of two brothers. There were another set of brothers, Nadab and Abihu. They were priests in Israel. They found out the hard way that God cares how we worship. They offered what was called, at the time, strange fire to the Lord. They did worship their own way. And in Leviticus 10.3, the Lord says, Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. That means I will be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I will be glorified. Nadab and Abihu found out the hard way that it matters how we worship. They were consumed by the fire of God. Jonathan Cruz says this in his book. He says, God will be regarded as holy among the people who draw near to Him in worship, either by faith or by fire from heaven. But you can rest assured, everyone's going to know who's in charge. Amen? If we were to sum this part of the message up, we might say this, worship will either be people-centered or God-centered, but it cannot be both. Worship can't be what I want and what God wants. So what we must do to, so, uh, to, have our, to ensure, rather, that our worship is God-centered is we must have services that are saturated with the Bible saturated with the Bible. Services in which the songs, the prayers, the readings, the sermons are full of Scripture. Such a service will be full of God Himself. Worship that pleases God, again, hangs on knowing and submitting to His agenda. And so far, what we've seen is that God cares about how we worship and that we are worshiping in a way that is pleasing to Him when we worship according to His Word. 
Again, as a reminder, let me read these verses. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near is to listen. Oh, sorry, to draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not they do not know that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Now, if we regard our steps in worship, then we need to know the proper steps to take. What does the Bible say about worship? What does it command? What does it prescribe for us? What does it forbid? After all, I don't know about you, but I don't want to face the consuming fire of God as Nadab and Abihu had to. Nor do I want to drop dead as Ananias and his wife Sapphira did in Acts 5 after lying to the Holy Spirit. Finally, we see in 1 Corinthians 11 that Paul warns the Corinthians that some of their own there within the church have faced sickness and death because they have failed to obey God's commands for receiving the Lord's Supper. So those, those things that the Bible clearly prescribes and commands are called elements. Elements. The elements of worship are the non-negotiables They are the scripturally mandated parts of what it means to publicly assemble and worship God. It's Cruz's definition for elements, but I thought it was helpful. Now, some of the foundational elements include weekly gathering for preaching, praying, and partaking of the Lord's Supper and baptism. In the earliest days of the Christian church, we read this in Acts 2.42, right after the 3,000 are brought to the Lord, not including women and children, It says this, it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. We read further there that they didn't neglect to meet together in homes, but also in the temple from week to week. And this is the process that you see throughout the New Testament. You read in Acts, you read the letters that are written to the churches, they're meeting together on the first day of the week for what? Worship. Other elements include reading Scripture, We see this in Colossians 4, 1 Timothy 4, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 Thessalonians 3. I can give all these later if anybody wants to know them, but singing is a part of, uh, is one of the elements of worship. 1 Corinthians 14, Ephesians 5, Colossians 3, again, giving gifts for the needs of the church and to the needy, Acts 6, Romans 12, 8, uh, and 13, uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, public confession of faith. 1 Timothy 6, 2 Timothy 1, 2 Thessalonians 2, confession of sin, 1 John 1. It's just some of the elements. There's some debate as to what are elements and what are not, uh, but largely those are ones that everyone agrees on, as well as the sacraments, which I mentioned earlier. In addition to elements, though, there are circumstances which must be decided upon. Again, Cruz has a definition for circumstances that I thought was helpful. They are those things not mandated in Scripture. And so it requires wisdom to implement them in the right and appropriate worship of God. Some examples of circumstances. What time do we begin each week? (laughs) What will the preacher wear? Today, I am dressed as though I'm either going to deliver your mail or deliver a sermon. You don't know which, right? But still, well, by now you might have figured it out. Will we use songbooks or a projector? Now, it's important for God's people, but especially the church elders, to clearly uh, clearly distinguish between elements and circumstances because people want to muddy the waters on what's an element and what's a circumstance, and we can't have the the waters muddied or we'll be in trouble. But we, we can only clearly distinguish those according to God's Word And it's important that we don't get them mixed up. So again, why? Because worship that pleases God hangs on knowing and submitting to His agenda. We've got to know what His agenda is. Now, one other important part of worship to consider is what do we do with the elements? What shape does the service take? In the coming weeks, we're going to look at that further. But for today, I I want us to rally around this one thought here is that the order of worship must have a gospel shape to it, which is what we talked about last week as we talked about how we're rehearsing the covenant week in and week out. And so when we say it needs to have a gospel covenant, we're just saying this, we want to adore the greatness of God. 
We want to confess our sinfulness. We want to hear of forgiveness in Christ. We want to be built up into Christ through preaching, prayer, and the sacraments. As we saw last week, it is God's goal for worship that we be reminded over and over again of the work that He does for us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, it's true that when you come into worship, God's people are at work. But the primary work of worship is done by God Himself. The primary work that is taking place in a worship service is not from the hard work of the worship team, though we appreciate them. Amen? Well, you know, 10 or 15 do, Alan. Okay? Just kidding. We all do. It's, it's not the hard work in sermon preparation that goes on during a week to get up and deliver a sermon. It's part of it. That's not the bulk of it. It's not the hard work in praying prayers together or organizing greeters for doors or ushers who are going to pass out the elements for the Lord's Supper here in a moment. Those are all works, and they're good works. They're things that God has given to us. But the greatest work that's taking place in worship is from God Himself toward His people. We're not passive in worship, we're active in worship, but when we come together for worship, we are meeting to have something done to and for us. We are gathering for the purpose of spiritual transformation. What we're saying when we walk into a worship service, or at least the posture of our heart, should be that, Heavenly Father, You are the potter and I'm the clay. This is Your workshop. You have the tools to mold me how you see fit. And if you'll come into worship that way, worship then is a gift from God Almighty for the molding of His people, the shaping of His people week in and week out. Into what? Well, Corinthians makes it abundantly clear that we're being molded and shaped into the image of the invisible Son of God. That we're being molded and shaped to bear His glory in the earth. That by the Spirit of God alive in us, we are being transformed from the inside out as we offer our bodies as living sacrifices. We are being renewed by the Spirit of God in our minds to know what is the good and acceptable and pleasing will of God. As Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us. It's important for us to understand that corporate worship is one of the major ways that God graciously serves us. His serving us is in sanctification. And He equips us to serve and glorify Him throughout the week. In worship, as Cruz says, we are merely responding to what God is doing to, for, in, and through us. It's important for us to recognize how much God does for us compared to how little we offer to Him in weekly worship. This enable our hearts to gladly submit to God and His agenda for us all. Worship that pleases God hangs on knowing and submitting to His agenda. But again, this is not easy for us. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. If you're a parent in here, it happens very early in the parenting process that a parent observes the innate difficulty of submission within their child. Amen? It can sometimes seem as if the good, right commands of a parent only heighten the desire to rebel within the child. Amen? There are few things more frustrating as a parent than to give your child a command, have them look you dead in the eye, and you see the wheels turning, right? It's like, no, don't do that anymore. And they're like... And then what do they do? Exactly what you just warned them not to do. And then they can't figure out why they get a spanking for it. It's like, oh, why? Because submission doesn't come naturally for us. It doesn't. This is a result of the fall of man. 
The temptation from Satan to Eve and Adam was that they could be their own God. And so what did they do? They rebelled against God and attempt to be God themselves. And we still battle this today. We want to break free from the establishment. We want to rebel against authority. Now granted, this isn't always a bad thing. But when it comes to God and His commands, it is most certainly always bad. Most Christians would agree on submission to God's commands for us in life. But if we are to obey God throughout the week, that submission must start on the first day of the week in the Lord's Day worship service. In weekly corporate worship, God's people assemble together. God reminds us of the all-important reality that what? He is king, we are his subjects. He is Lord, we are his servants. He is shepherd, we are his sheep. He is God and we are his creatures. He is in heaven and we are on earth. Amen. comes from Cruz's book. Submission doesn't come naturally for us. So we get a much needed reminder every Sunday morning during worship that we are called to submit to God. Worship is primary in our training as disciples of Christ because in worship we're learning how to trust. We're learning how to uh, be obedient. We're learning how to submit. In other words, in worship we are growing in faith. Cruz painted a really great picture. He said, The God-centered worship service is the garden in which faith is planted, grown, and cultivated. Amen. And so therefore, brothers and sisters, we must surrender our wants. We must surrender our preferences. We must recognize that whatever God says is most important, that is what we're going to do. And so we submit ourselves to His agenda. And in so doing, we reflect the heart of Christ. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God in the flesh, told the crowds and His disciples on many occasions that He did nothing apart from the will of His Father. He did nothing apart from the commands of His Father. He was perfectly submissive to the will of His Father, and so too we must be. Worship that pleases God hangs on knowing and submitting to His agenda. But it's important for you to remember that that's true, but it's not true because God is needy. Rather, it is true because God loves us. It's true because God serves us during worship, giving us precisely what we need to be His faithful followers and preserving worshipers until the day that we are with Him in heaven forever. In worship, He works in us His own eternal good, Cruz says his intention is to pour out his grace and to abundantly bless us. I ask, why would we reject that? Why would we not submit to that? But that's exactly what we're trying to do if we try to come up with new ways to worship him that go against the the commands or the elements that he's prescribed for us in worship. To do that is rebellion but we must be found as those who submit to God. Amen? We must be found as those who submit to His agenda for weekly worship if we also want to be found as those who are blessed by God on the final day. To obey God's commands is to know and to be filled with the very joy of Christ. And so let's not trade that opportunity for even one millisecond of worshiping the golden calf of our own creation. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, we adore you. We adore your greatness. We adore your grandeur. We adore the fact, Lord, that you have drawn us to yourself today. And Lord, we praise you for the opportunity we have now to worship your name to come in week in and week out to submit to your agenda that you might literally, figuratively, even spiritually for sure, stoop down from heaven and serve your people. Just as Christ grabbed a rag and a basin of water and washed the disciples' feet. 
but Lord, you're serving us is not because we are mighty. <laughs> Heaven forbid we think that. You're serving us is not because you need us, that you're empty without our worship. It's none of those things. It's merely that you love your people, that you delight in equipping your people to walk as those um, who carry your glory in the earth. But you're equipping us for good works. You're, you're strengthening our hearts. You're helping us walk through fire. You're helping us endure hardship and tragedy. You're granting to us in a worship service joy where there was once sorrow. You're filling us, Lord, with everything we need from heaven on high. Heaven forbid we come and hear, Lord, and try to set the agenda. Help us to be men and women and boys and girls. I praise you, Father, that you have transformed our hearts and minds through the years to have boys and girls in here with us learning these truths so early, fortified in their mind as well, Lord, that the weekly worship service is essential for them for their discipleship, for their following you week in and week out. And Lord, the way you've ordained things, as we heard about in Sunday school this morning, as the second chapter of Judges reminds us that the generations after the faithful generations forgot God. Why did they forget? Father, we know it's because they were not taught. And so Lord, help us to be men and women who teach the seriousness of worship. that it is essential to our Christian faith, that we need it every single week so that in practice and in teaching, the children here observe it in us as well. Lord, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for your word today. We ask that you would help us to grasp the truths of it and to seek your face each week. It's in the name of Christ, I pray. Amen.